thought we'd take a couple minutes before we start the class to look at the website we keep referring to and how to get to it and how to use it. And um, I've started a web browser. I'm going to assume you know that much. And so I click on a new tab and I type in the name of the site, which is galenpura.online. And then I press enter and let's see what comes up. There it is. Right, there's the website, Unseen World of the Bible. Uh, if you wish to send an email, just click on the name. But we're now in lesson 10 today, so I come down to here where it says session 10. I click on the 10, and that takes me to the things we've already posted for today's lesson. So for example, here's the session outline. If I want to view it, all I have to do is click on it. It opens up a new tab and shows me the paper, which is essentially just the content of the slides we're going to look at today. Coming back to the main page, I think. Right. If you want to download the PowerPoint slides that we're going to look at, we we'll click here. I to view them, or you with the left button, if you use your right hand mouse button, you can say save link as, and the slides file will be saved to your hard drive. Now let's do that. Save link as. The navigator should open up and say yes. Put that in my downloads folder. Click on save. And it will go straight into the onto your hard drive. I put on a second paper here today called 17 Names and Titles of a Promised Messiah. So one of the things that Jewish one of the problems that Jewish people have to this day when they read the Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament, they say we see no proof of, of Jesus as Messiah. But this this is the the essence of today's lesson. Why is it that Jesus as Messiah is not clear to those who only read the Tanakh, the Old Testament? Why Jesus, when he was resurrected, said to his disciples, guys, I told you about my dying and rising again. But they never, they never really understood what he meant. Why not? because they had never figured it out from the Tanakh, the Old Testament. So today, I'm hoping that what we can do is look at the explanations that Jesus may have given when he said, well, explain to them from the Psalms, the prophets, and the other Old Testament writings all about himself. That particular paper, if I click on it, it consists of a list of 17 names and titles of a promised Messiah as revealed in the Tanakh. The difficulty was this. Every one of these terms used of Messiah was also used of a non-Messiah. So, for example, the term anointed translated Messiah or Christ in Hebrew or Greek was also used of King Cyrus, a pagan emperor of the um, Persian Empire. Yeah, they, they conquered the Babylonian Empire. But then it's also used, the same thing is used later, of someone who is clearly a special king who would come someday, also called the Anointed Bride. The Unseen World of the Bible, we've come to session 10, titled Hidden in Plain Sight, same title as the chapter in the book we're reading, 11th of December, 2022. I have three objectives for myself today, for you as well. First of all, by the end of this lesson, we shall be able to describe Israel's eight failures, the reason for which God had to do something more. Than Secondly, 
we shall recognize 17 clues from the Tanakh about the coming Messiah, or Christ, or the Anointed One. <clears throat> now, there are probably 21, because almost everything important in the Bible it comes in either a set of 7, 14, or 21. So if you can think of the four others, you can help us out. And thirdly, we shall identify new divine council members. We've uh, dealt with the, the failed council members already. Remember, you can always download the, the outline point slides from this website. Fail. Failure number one it was, of course, the fall or the sin, the rebellion of a great invisible being whom we call Satan or the devil, the serpent. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Right? That was the end of the sixth day of creation. Everything was good. Hunky dory. Copacetti. Apparently, not even Satan had fallen yet. However, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Satan himself had decided that he wanted to be like the Most High, that he would ascend up above the angelic stars. And then he tempted the humans to obey him rather than to obey Yahweh God. And because they were tempted and fell for it, they fell under the power of Satan. Well, God was displeased with this, and so he cursed him. And so from that day on, Satan, rather than having access to the, to the highness of the heavens, spends most of his time on earth, eating dust, so to speak. And what was the second failure? Fall. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. So God's desire, will, and expressed command for humanity was to Keep on multiplying until you fill the earth to its capacity to sustain human life. Now, Satan had another plan for humanity, and those who are inspired by this Satan to this day have plans to depopulate based on various kinds of climate hoaxes. But then, verse 17, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. God banished him from the Garden of Eden. So we know what had happened. The, the man and the woman both had succumbed to Satan. He had suborned them and had eaten of the, that which was forbidden. And notice, Satan has to eat dirt, and now the ground is cursed. And so we get this picture of the heavens from which we are now separated, limited to an earth which is under adverse conditions, to say the least. The third failure, humanity's wickedness. When God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created the male and female and blessed them. Is it quite all right to be male and female? Mm -hmm. To live together? Yeah. God created us this way. We're very much uh, similar to him, not in his eternity, but he put us in charge of the world. But now Satan is in charge of the world because we fell and submitted to Satan. As a result then, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, and that every inclination of thoughts in the human heart was only evil all the time. Even when they were having their best day, and their best philosophy, and their best contemplation of morality and the goodness of humanity, it was in violation of the will of God, or at the very least, not in submission to Him. So, what was the result then? He sent the great flood. All right, there was a fourth failure, and that was our direct disobedience. After the flood, God renewed His command. God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. All right, yeah, but He still wanted that done. Now, had we filled the earth earlier, God would have extended the garden of Eden throughout the whole earth, and we would have been living in a kind of paradise to this day. But after the flood, 
He says, all right, we're going to start again. The earth is not going to be nearly as productive as it used to be, but keep on filling the earth. Why? Why would God be interested in multiplying fallen, sinful humans? Because he had a plan. He had a plan for us. To redeem us, send Jesus in as our Savior, convert hundreds of millions, perhaps billions of humans to himself. By the way, about how many Christians are there in the world today? Two billion. At least. Nominally, they'd say, I side with Jesus. However, <laughs> what could possibly go wrong now? <laughs> and they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with the tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Uh, this <laughs> phrase, a tower that reaches to the heavens. You know, when we were children attending Sunday school or we read this someplace or saw it in a movie, we got the idea that they were going to build something like the Burj Khalif, that would be the highest building in the world and reach up to heaven. Is that intelligent? What's the point? They wanted God to come to them, right. not for us to come to God. Exactly. We know that throughout antiquity, both from the Bible and from archaeology, that ancient peoples would build towers with temples on the top, make it very elaborate, and bring gifts into the temple, hoping that some kind of a god would come down, dwell in the temple, and then they could pray to it, get favors from it, and maybe stop it from harming them. You know, most folk who believe in many gods around the world actually don't like those gods, but they're afraid of them. I once was in a conference in Ethiopia, back under the communist regime, and there I met one of the leaders of the fastest growing underground church, perhaps in the world at that time. And I asked him, why is it that so many are coming to faith in Jesus? His reply was, because he's stronger than the spirits. When we come to faith in Jesus, we get control over them and we can send them away. Well, if this were not enough, there was a fifth failure. Be careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression. And who is he? Is him we're talking about? Yahweh. In the form of the angel of Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, who was going to lead the people across the wilderness into the promised land. They were fairly warned, do not rebel against him. He will not forgive you. Unfortunately, not one of those who disobeyed me and tested me ten times will ever see the land. No one who is treating me with contempt will ever see it. Um, ten times? If you count up all the rebellions in the accounts, the biblical accounts, it's not ten. Um, well, maybe it really was, but they're not all recorded. But I believe it was pointed out that ten times was like our expression, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. Anyway, they had surpassed the tolerable number. And so, so that generation died in the wilderness before the folk arrived in their promised land. Well, there's a, another failure, and that was Israel's idolatry. Here was the warning. When you look up to the sky and see all the heavenly array, do not be enticed to worship the things the Lord your God has apportioned to all the nations under heaven. What things were those? Stars? Planets. Planets. Those would be the physical things. But these are things now that God apportioned to the nations. By now you understand the biblical concept of the divine council. How that God had put the various nations under the guidance and protection of angelic beings. They were to guide those people into righteous living. However, many of them failed. Some outright rebelled, and many of them welcomed worship, making themselves out to be gods. In fact, I was riding on a train once in India, and was listening to an evangelist speaking to another guy who was speaking English, and one of them made the point that, well, we have many gods in India, the other one said, well, from the beginning, 
it was demon spirits who began parading as gods. The other guy had to stop and ponder and think about that for a moment as their conversation went on. But what happened? All the leaders of the priests and the people of Judah became more and more unfaithful following all the detestable practices of the nation. So this was in Judah. Now, when it was in the northern kingdom, and it's how Ahab set up an altar for the god Baal in the temple of Baal and, and put up an Asherah pole. When we come to the New Testament, we discover failure number seven. Heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. So the, this one whom we call Messiah, he was introduced to the nation of Israel. And when Jesus was baptized, the Spirit of God visibly came down upon him. And a voice from heaven spoke and identified this man, Jesus, then, as the promised one called the Son of God. Did God ever get married and have a baby? No. All right, when we used to live in another country, every night the mosques around the country would chant, sometimes for hours, over the loudspeakers. There is only one God, and he has no son. There is only one God, and he has no son. There is only one God, and he has no son. Well, God just said, I have a son. Although many of the Jewish nation received him as Messiah, later, one of the <coughs> disciples of Jesus said this, You have betrayed and murdered him, you who have received the law that was given through the angels, but have not obeyed it. Many of Israel committed what we today would call theocide. The living Son of God himself, the eternal Yahweh, who had come down in human form, had been put to death, crucified. Why would God allow such a thing to happen? I have, I've had Muslims tell me over the years, Jesus did not die on the cross for two reasons. Now first, the Quran says it was Judas Iscariot who became the substitute who was crucified. And secondly, God would never allow a holy prophet to be harmed, hurt, or murdered by others. So logically, it never happened. They got it wrong. Well, whoever told you that lived six to seven hundred years after the fact. They weren't there. The eyewitnesses who were there said, yes, it was Jesus he was crucified, but he did die, and he did return to life. An eighth failure we'll call Israel's persecution against the first Christians. Here's, at first, many of the Jewish people received Jesus. We read here in verses 36. Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus crucified both Lord and Messiah. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Anyone who feels that they would like to become a follower of Jesus, be forgiven and receive everlasting life, what should they do? What was Peter's reply to these guys? Repent and be baptized. All of you repent and then let each one of you be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And then you will all receive the Holy Spirit of God who will come dwell in you, love you. However, for perhaps the majority of Israel at the time, it was a different outcome. A great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Yeah, so the movement hit some hard times. Maybe partly because in order to get the Christians out of Jerusalem where they could do a lot more good in the rest of the country and beyond, he allowed a great persecution. God himself became a human to fulfill his plan. Why would God have to come down and accomplish all that he had told the humans to do and later had told Israel to do? Because they didn't do it yet. They didn't know it. He had to do it on his own. Right, yeah. So he undertook to fulfill his own plan. 
In Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in love with form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. When Jesus Christ came into the world, the fullness of deity, all that the living creator God is, was in Christ. Who had come down in human form now, and so those of you who come into relationship with Jesus Christ, you have all you need. You get everything that God has to offer <coughs> through Jesus. You don't need somebody else's special meetings and particular experience. But he is the head of every power and authority. Oh, every. Is he the head over Putin? <laughs> what about the mafia leader Zelensky? Uh, what about uh, Biden? Well, and Kotek? Um, all right, but are there any other powers and authorities that this verse is talking about besides political leaders? Yes, he not. Usually when Paul talks about powers and authorities, he doesn't mean the human authorities. He means the spiritual authorities who are the ones who whisper evil ideas into the minds of political authorities. Why would they do that? It's the intention of the evil spiritual realm to rule over earth, pushing aside Yahweh and the humans. They really would like to see most humans die because then they go into the underworld where Satan rules over them directly and then they get to rule over this paradise of earth. More about this. God himself became human in order to fulfill this plan. This mystery for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right. It's all right there. First, what is a mystery? Something that was once hidden but is now made known. Exactly. So it's no longer a mystery, but it was a mystery down through the ages, even throughout the stories of the Old Testament, exactly how God was going to accomplish this. But now, it's now being made known. But he says, through the church, that is through Jesus' community, uh, made known to whom? Who's in the earth? He's in the heaven. Yes. And that's the main action point. Many of our earthly rulers and authorities never figure it out. Or they've, they've heard it, they've figured it out, and they don't like it. Because they have their own plans to exploit world resources and to depopulate the rest of us. When we talk about God having a plan, is that in this verse anywhere? His eternal purpose. His eternal purpose, right. And what was his eternal purpose? To draw people to himself. And about drawing them to himself. To so then repopulate the earth. Yes, to repopulate the earth, to rule over humanity, over an Edenic, paradisical, renewed earth. And it really, do you think he'll ever accomplish it? Yes. 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 We're counting on it. However, the rebellious spirits down through the ages largely misunderstood God's plan. Exactly how he would wrestle the planet away from them and still have it in charge of human beings who were not rebellious anymore. The rulers of this age are coming to nothing. We declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, it would not have crucified the Lord of glory. In the rulers of this age, you know we're talking about the spirit beings, the unseen rulers, they're losing their power. Every time someone comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, especially out amongst us Gentiles, 
they lose some power. What's encouraging is I've heard today there will be more people who make a profession of faith in Christ today than the world total population of Christians at the time when Nero was in charge. And according to some calculations, nearly half, maybe more than half, of all the human beings who have ever lived are alive today. And anything you and I can do to propagate the gospel, either directly, face to face, or through supporting ministries who do it very well, we get closer to the goal. And of course, what is the goal here? What is this leading to? Our glory, our happiness, our eternal life, our rejoicing in the presence of our Creator forever and ever. Now, these rulers of the age, why did they crucify Jesus? He said he was God. Well, that was a political reason, a good excuse. They thought that they, that would put an end to his power. Exactly. Uh, you see, the evil spirits, they knew that Jesus was the Messiah. But what they did not understand was this, that when Messiah Christ would be crucified, the humans would be released from their power. Because we're now all our sins are forgiven because of what Jesus did in dying, and the eternal life we now enjoy is the life that he had when he came back to life and now offers to us. Yeah, they would not have crucified Jesus. They would have just let him do whatever he could. Isn't that where the, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe illustrates that well with the sacrifice that they didn't understand was actually what broke the power? And then, he followed the ways of this world and the Lord and kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Well, the spirit, they are very busy trying to keep this gospel suppressed, and they are very actively at work amongst the disobedient. A couple weeks ago, there was an article in the paper somewhere about, I think a pastor, was it Canada or the US, who was arrested by the police because he had suggested in a sermon that the local municipal, municipal authorities were deluded by Satan. Now, he was probably right, but he probably didn't say it very well. <laughs> we should limit that to uh, your, your, your Sunday class. <laughs> but then, not only did the spirit world misunderstand God's plan to redeem us, but did Jesus' own followers, his disciples, they also misunderstood. Jesus was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask. Well, they didn't understand. Why not? Didn't they know the Tanakh? Didn't they hear scriptures read in the synagogue every week? Did they not memorize passages and help their children to memorize them? Why did they misunderstand that the Messiah would have to die and then rise again? It is a big book. <laughs> <laughs> the culture of the time, they were really wanting political they wanted a political leader more than a spiritual one. And quite frankly, putting together all the pieces really wasn't that easy to do. Especially when all of their spiritual teachers didn't get it. They didn't get it, so they weren't they had to put it together in the synagogue. Why do you think they were afraid to ask? I used to live in a community where most of the young men were being educated by a master. And the master would surround himself with disciples. And the master would teach the disciples. The disciples would memorize his teaching. They would memorize long portions of their holy book. And their task was not to question. Their duty was to memorize, learn, and obey. And if you asked him a question that might expose your ignorance, you could be disciplined, or just to question his teaching. So instead of learning, they were just gathering information. Gathering or memorizing right. or wondering or misunderstanding. And of course, they were also jockeying for authority. They knew that he was the Messiah and were hoping that he would soon overthrow Rome and political authority in Israel 
and that then they, as his nearest disciples, would become the most powerful men in the country. And so I think partly they did not want to anger him, disturb him, or be seen as ignorant. Now that's my guess. Otherwise, I don't know. I, I tend to view the world through experience. Just that my experiences, many of them were rather odd. Right, verse 44. This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the laws of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So, Jesus then, risen from death, meets with his disciples. They're just beginning to figure out that when he said he would die and rise, it was literally true. They saw him put to death. They now have met with him, risen back to life. And so now he explains to them the Tanakh, which consists of the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, how if you get all the right pieces from those books and put them together, they actually do describe Jesus. How he came, what he taught, what he did, how he died, how he rose, and what he would do next. Perhaps our task is to do that. What can I do all week? I'm retired. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> so I began looking up names and titles of Messiah uh, throughout the time. I found 17. I'm still looking for the other four. All of these terms have both a social meaning and a predictive meaning. Every one of them could be used of ordinary human beings, but could also be used of that special human being who will one day come into the world, whom we call Messiah or Christ. We won't look at all the verses now. One of these was the term anointed. In Hebrew, Mashiach is, um, means anointed. And the Greek form of that, Christos, means anointed. <laughs> But it was uh, sometimes used of ordinary humans, other times about a special anointed king who would come in the future. And then he was sometimes called a branch, as a branch of the family, a branch of uh, the house of the King David. In fact, he sometimes called David. There was a historical David, and then there was also the future king who would come as part of David's family, who therefore could also be called David, just as every generation of Pharaoh was called Pharaoh. And there was the Holy One. Daniel talked about a Holy One who came and sat down in his vision. And then Jeremiah talked about a Holy One who was yet to come. And then the term king itself. Many historical kings, and Hosea talked about a king who eventually would rule over the entire world. And Lord, in the sense of uh, sir, or owner, in Psalm 110, it talks about that Lord, whom Yahweh would send into the world. Messenger, Malachi said, the messenger of the new covenant, whom you're looking for. He would be called a prince, again, who would rule the world. The righteous one, Isaiah 53, talks about my righteous one. And he was called a root, the only descendant of Jesse, a ruler. Micah said, the Lord will raise up a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And he's called a scepter, yeah. rod that kings carry. And there you have a, an ancient carving of King Darius holding his scepter, the sign of authority. He was called seed or descendant. And in Genesis 3.15 talks about human beings who would follow Satan, but a special human being who would be born of the woman who would eventually crush the power of Satan. And the servant, and the famous passage in Isaiah 53, my servant, who will bear the sins and transgressions of my people. And shepherd, the one who would shepherd Israel and the, and the nations, and he was called the Son of God, or God's Son. Daniel, of course, called him both Son of Man and Son of God. The last one I found was the star. 
a star would arise over Jacob, over Israel. And it would, again, as a kind of ruler. So when you put all of these pieces together, you do get many or most of the details of Jesus. Having accomplished all that's necessary for our forgiveness and our eternal life, God now calls us believers his children or his sons. Now, our newest translations don't like to talk about us as being God's sons. Why not? It's not it's it's too exclusive. It sounds exclusive. What about his daughters? <laughs> well, they just say it children. That works. And that's fine. However, the word son was often used of anyone in the family who could inherit. So, the word son meant uh, an inheritor or an heir more than male child. Although if you are talking about children and you are distinguishing the boys from the girls, I mean, you have to do that. In our neighborhood where all the little boys and girls ran around naked, they put earrings on the girls. You could always recognize which they were. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. That is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Uh, he loves us so much. And when we are, when we respond to His love, and we return that love by obeying. Jesus getting baptized to identify with him. However, the rest of the world doesn't know who we are. We are the craziest. We are the religious nuts. What are some of the things they say about Christians these days? Fundamentalist. Fundamentalist. Demented. Demented. Haters, yeah. Intolerant. Uh, I was in another congregation here in Portland for a while back when the homosexual community decided that our church was hateful. The homosexuals would come down every Sunday morning, walk around in front of the churches holding placards, telling how hateful we were. And then one of the television crews showed up to film them and film and so forth. I got to talking to the crew chief briefly, and he thought we were hateful. I said, listen, we have many homosexuals in our congregation, and they are finding new life in Jesus. <laughs> and you ran off? <laughs> what is this? They're finding love here. They're finding a new way of life. And we have a few in this congregation. Because we do offer a new way of life to everyone who is leading a desolate or a rebellious way of life, we are said to be intolerant of their chosen way of life. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Amen. We have already become God's children, that is, his sons, those who inherit his kingdom. But he hasn't shown to the rest of the world who we are. But we shall be like him. How's that? How will we be like Jesus? We'll have those resurrection bodies. Right. Yeah. We will, our bodies will be changed. No more aches and pains. And able to rejoice and enjoy every facet of the, of the entire earth. All right. The spirits, however, did recognize Jesus as Messiah. Here are some indications of that. The devil said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. First class condition. So we could translate, listen, since you're the son of God, uh, and you're hungry, turn these stones into bread. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted, have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? And they were worried that Jesus might have come to send them to hell then, <clears throat> but he didn't. An impure spirit cried out at the top of his voice, go away, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Yes, that was one of those titles we looked at earlier. So the impure, the evil spirits, and even Satan himself, they knew who he was. 
What they did not know was that his death would be their loss of power. So meanwhile, what has happened to Satan? At one time, he was one of the highest of the spirit being, had access to Yahweh. Even later, he could still go meet with Yahweh at the council and argue with him. He has been demoted to what some call the Lord of the dead. He will never be Lord of the living. The devil was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. What beginning are we talking about? The garden. As things were before the flood. He was already a murderer then. Uh, how do we know that? Cain killed Abel. Cain killed Abel, and also God had said to the humans, if you disobey me, you will have to die. And he came and tempted them, got them to disobey God, he caused our death. But that death is passed on to all of us. It's still very real. What's God's solution to our death? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus' death, resurrection, and later on, our resurrection. We shall return to life to live forever. Yahweh God said to the servant, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Now some young earth creationists have made a mistake trying to prove that snakes eat dust. They're kind of missing the point. <laughs> Satan is, his destiny is the earth and the under earth. Not the heavens, not the mountain of God. <laughs> Meanwhile, what is he doing? The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And when you tell some people the truth about Jesus, by the time you finish your sentence, they've already forgotten what you said. Jesus shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break with the power of him, the rules of the power of death. That is the devil. So Jesus became a human to save us from death, physical and spiritual death. Now this phrase, the power of him who holds the power of death, <clears throat> a, a superficial reading of that in English, what does it seem to mean? When we say that the state holds the power of death, we mean the one who can execute us. Yeah, us. right, the government can execute us. In a state that has the power of death, can anybody else execute? Yes. yes. I saw an article yesterday, a police report on the increase in murders in Portland, Oregon. We're catching up with Chicago. <laughs> so, yes, there are many in our cities who have the power of death. Fortunately, there are a few of us who even have it concealed behind their shirt, <laughs> which is kind of keeping the, otherwise the death rate would be much higher at the present time. And so when we're talking here about the power of him who holds the power of death, this is the same word that the scripture uses of the spiritual beings when it talks about with the rulers, the authorities, and the powers. And so this is, the Satan is the one who holds the power of death. He is the ruler over the dead. If you reject Jesus and die in your sin, you will never go into the kingdom of God nor the heavens. You will be stuck in the underworld forever. And you will have a ruler. He hates you and you will live like him. For your choice is to put your faith in Jesus who loves you and you will love him forever. And finally, I saw Satan fall like lightning. I have given you authority to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Well, things do harm us, but the yes. spiritual authorities cannot harm us because we belong to Jesus. And if you'd like to see Satan fall from his authority over a community any place in the world, the most effective way of doing that? Prayer. Prayer is number one. So I was in Pakistan and I met a uh, Presbyterian missionary over there, he actually was born and grew up there. And so he said, let's go out and uh, break the power of Satan today. And so we drove around and he told me what to look for. The symbols on buildings and sacred sites around the city. He said, those are sites that the local Muslims have empowered by Satan. And he said, Mike, God has given me a threefold task in this country. Number one is to 
pray to break the power of these spirits. Uh, secondly, is to share the gospel with all who will listen. And thirdly, is to implement a pastoral training program that he invi invited me there to introduce. And the second thing is, preach the gospel. Share the truth about Jesus. Wherever we do that, the power of Satan is broken. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. This grace has now been revealed through the appearing of our Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. All right. You see, Jesus is the one who brought to light God's plan for immortality for us. It wasn't that clear. Yes, future resurrection of believers was taught in the Tana, but they didn't know when it would happen or how it would happen. When Jesus came and actually died and rose again, he's the one who showed how it would happen. And then we, God's children, will join the divine council. I think this is the end. To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Literally sons who inherit. Those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead, they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, sons. Right. This talk of God's children, God's sons, remember that was Old Testament language for angelic beings, member of God's divine council. Many of them fell, they sinned, they rebelled, some were in hell today, and they're to be replaced. By whom? Yes. No, the, the council is going to get very, very big. In Christ Jesus, you are all children, the sons of God, through faith. Because you are his sons, God has sent the spirit of his son, Jesus, into our hearts. The creation waits in eager expectation for the children of the sons of God to be revealed.